Hello, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. I think it's about time we can start. Uh, our guest is here, Sam Wharton. And uh, so let us begin. I can, I'm certain this is going to be a really great conversation. So, uh, top of the hour, I'll quickly introduce, welcome everyone to the seventh conversation hour by DCW. Uh, uh, DCW or the Deoband Community Wikipedia is a recognized user group affiliate of the Wikimedia Foundation. It takes its name from the Deoband Islamic Seminary and it aims at improving Wikipedia and its sister projects with knowledge and information related not only related to but not limited to global Muslim academia, scholarship, history, and culture. And DCW works at a global level in all languages. Now uh, we have a very special guest with us, Sam Walton. Sam is the senior pro product manager at Wikimedia Foundation. And Sam will be speaking on navigating the Wikipedia library. Uh, that's a subject that I'm also very much interested in. So the Wikipedia library uh, Sam has worked on, as a senior project uh, product manager, Sam has intimately worked on the Wikipedia library. And this conversation hour will give us an overview of the Wikipedia library, including its purpose, usage, guidelines, and tips for maximizing its benefits. And Sam will also give us a live demonstration showcasing how to access the tools and how to use advanced tools such as search integration. Uh, and without further ado, over to you, Sam. And after uh, Sam does with his wonderful demonstration, we'll have some time for questions so that we can get some questions and feedback from others. Also, for just full disclaimer, uh, the meeting is being recorded. And uh, I would once again like to thank Jessica, who facilitated the recording of this meeting. Thank you so much. Over to you, Sam. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, I am just going to present my screen. Let's see. Awesome. So I hope you can all see that. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. So yeah, I've been working on uh, the Wikipedia library at the Wikimedia Foundation for, I think, eight years now. Um, I was a volunteer editor before that on the English Wikipedia. Um, I was actually a user of the library. That's kind of how I joined in, in the first place. So um, glad to be coming full circle and, and introducing you folks to the library. So today I want to give uh, kind of an overview of, of what the library is and how it works. Um, as said, I'll give a bit of a, a demo and kind of walk through how to use the library, how you can use it to do your research. A couple of tips and tricks for things that maybe aren't quite um, super obvious when you first use the library. And then, yeah, absolutely happy to answer um, any and all questions. I see there's one in the chat already, which I will I'll come back to for sure. So as you probably know, if you've been editing Wikipedia, um, when we add content to the encyclopedia, the idea is that 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 content should be coming from a reliable source. Um, we should be going out and finding a book or a newspaper or um, some kind of reliable website that contains information and then summarizing that information on Wikipedia. And that's great. That's uh, you know how Wikipedia has become uh, the reliable and trustworthy website that it, that it has over the years. But you can run into some, uh, some issues while doing that, uh, the most um, frustrating one that we found when we were speaking to, to Wikipedia editors way back when um, is that you run into a paywall. So you try to access some scientific journal or maybe an ebook, um, many news websites nowadays. And when you go to read that source that you think is going to be really useful for your Wikipedia article, you find out that in this case, you need to pay, you know, 12 US dollars to access it for, for 48 hours, or you need to pay $49 to access the uh, the PDF and actually download the, the article, which is um, pretty extortionate, really, for, for that one paper that ultimately might not even be useful to you, right? You might go and read it and then find out that that's not even the, the source that you needed. 
So the idea of the Wikipedia library is that we can help you get past that paywall um, and be able to use that, that research for your Wikipedia article. So here is that paper um, when accessed through the library, you can read the whole thing, download the PDF, um, do whatever you need to do with it and, and cite it on Wikipedia. Uh, and all, all for free, all without having to pay $49 to download a PDF. So uh, 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 in, a, in a broad sense, the Wikipedia library is um, like, a, like an in-person library, but you can access it digitally um, and you can access it by, by virtue of being a, an active Wikipedia editor. Uh, the library has more than 80 publishers um, participating in it that are accessible to you, and they're all accessible for free, um, and they would all require you to spend some money um, to access them usually. Uh, the library can be accessed by the URL on the screen. I'll show that again later and obviously give you a full demo of what you'll find there. Um, but in the library, we have access to um, a whole range of leading publishers and aggregators from EBSCO, JSTOR, ProQuest, Wiley. Um, we have newspaper databases, uh, newspapers.com, British Newspaper Archive, um, and, and plenty of others. And although there's a lot of uh, English content in the library, there's also plenty of non-English content. Um, we cover languages including Arabic, German, French, Turkish, Japanese. Um, there's really quite a quite a breadth of, of content in the library for, for you to dig through. So I mentioned the library is for Wikipedia editors, and we do have some criteria for accessing the library. So specifically, the library is for experienced Wikipedia editors primarily. Um, so the criteria are here. They are that you need to be using a Wikipedia account with more than 500 edits. Those edits can be to any Wikimedia project. That doesn't mean you know one, one specific project. So if you edit multiple Wikimedia projects, that's fine. We'll take a look at the edit count across all of those. Your account needs to be at least six months old, just since the day that you created the account, not necessarily since you, you know, started editing. You need to have made some edits recently. We look for 10 edits over the, the last month, um, and we need you to have no active blocks on your account. Um, that last one is a little bit flexible. Um, sometimes Wikipedia editors have blocks that are sort of trivial. You know, maybe you have a partial block from one page, or you've been blocked on a project that actually you don't edit, and you edit somewhere else. That's fine. We can make exceptions for those. Um, but broadly speaking, those are the, the sort of criteria you need to meet. The reason for that is just that because we get this access for free and in partnership with these organizations, we need to make sure that um, folks aren't just creating a Wikipedia account not editing Wikipedia, but but being able to use the library, we want to make sure that it really is sort of active Wikipedia editors that are using it. So how do you know when you've crossed the threshold? Well, you will receive a notification on Wikipedia. Um, I'm sure that some of the folks here have already seen this, um, but when you cross that 500 edit and six month threshold, you'll get this notification that you see at the top here that says, congratulations, you're now eligible. Uh, clicking that link will take you through to the library where you can log in. You don't need to register a new account on, on the Wikipedia library. You log in using your Wikipedia account using OAuth, which you might have seen if you've logged into to other sort of third party tools um, for Wikipedia. So I will now jump over to a demo to show you what the library looks like once you are in there. So let me just... Uh, ba -ba -ba. Share this tab instead. Let me zoom in a little bit to make sure you can see that. So when you receive that notification, this is the sort of homepage that you'll land on. Um, here you can see some of the partners that we have in the library, check out some of the, the categories. But if you are eligible, if you meet these criteria, then you can just click login. And you'll need to log into your Wikipedia account, as I mentioned. Um, but once you've done that, it's uh, it's straight on through to the library. So by default, this is what you will see. Um, there is a long list of all of the different collections that we have in the library. And I want to draw your attention to these three tabs here, favorites, my collections, and available collections. So by default, when you open the library, you will start in my collections. Everything in my collections, you have full access to immediately. I don't know if you can hear that as a helicopter flying really low over my house. 
it's fun. I'm, I hope you can still hear me. Um, so everything in this section, you can access straight away. So um, pretty wide range of, of content from the library. Actually, most of the library's content is, is available straight away. And if you see something here that you want to access, um, let's say and or reviews, then you can just click this blue access collection button and you will go straight through to their website. Now, once you're on one of these websites, you can double check that you're, you're in the right place. You'll often see something like access provided by Wikipedia or by the Wikipedia library. Sometimes it says the Wikimedia Foundation, but somewhere on the page, it should say something like access provided by Wikipedia. And then once you're here, you can you can do your research. Um, I don't know if I know reviews has any content about Wikipedia, but I'll I'll do that search. Yeah, here we go. There's some there's some papers that mention Wikipedia, and I can go straight through to those those PDFs um, and start reading them, um, and use them on Wikipedia if I want to. So jumping back to the library, so that's how that works for for basically anything on this page. Um, sometimes you'll see something like this, a service issue. Uh, that means there's some kind of problem with this collection in particular at the moment. If you click those, you'll see something like an, an issue is impacting access, and there'll be a link. That goes to Fabricator, where you'll find some information about what exactly the problem is. Um, something like this that says service issue means you can probably still use it, but there might be something wrong. Um, there are other collections that might say temporarily unavailable, which means that usually we would have that collection, but right now something's broken with it and, and we're working on fixing it. Um, and again, there'll be some, some documentation of that link, which uh, can explain sort of what's going on uh, and is where we'll post updates. So this is a lot of collections that are available for you. Um, the first time you use the library, you might want to just sort of read through these, maybe not in full, but, but have a scan through, see what, what sorts of things are available. Um, and then beyond those, there is these available collections. So if you click this tab, you'll come over to a new set of collections. Um, these ones don't say access collection, they say apply. And that's because these ones have a limited amount of access available. So whereas in, in my collections, you can just, anyone can access this straight away if they've, if they've logged in successfully. In available collections, each of these only has so many uh, spots available. So, for example, Adam Matthew. Um, that's actually a bad example because I don't know how many we have available there. Let's see. Ooh. So, for Baylor University Press, we actually only have 50 accounts available, um, and we've currently distributed 27 of those. So, once we hit that 50, we're going to have to pause and not be able to give access to, to more users for a while, um, which is why they require an application. So, again, take a look through these. Um, if there's a collection that is of interest to you, then please do apply. Um, although we have a limited number of seats, usually when we fill them up, we can go and ask for, for some more. Uh, we just have to usually go to the publisher and ask, can we have some more access codes? Can we have, um, can we give access to more Wikipedia editors? Um, but to apply, you just click apply here and you'll get a couple of questions. Um, the main one is, why do you want to access this resource? So this is just an opportunity for you to say, you know, I, I would like access to this because I write about such and such on Wikipedia. So for example, British Newspaper Archive, maybe you write about British history and you would really appreciate those newspapers that, that are in the British Newspaper Archive. That just helps us prioritize. You know, if we get a bunch of applications for one collection and we only have so many, um, so many accounts available, so many codes available, we can prioritize the people that are more likely to, to make good use of that, that source. So there's about another 30 collections there which, which are available. Um, if one of them says waitlisted, like this, this art magazine, um, that means we've distributed all of the accounts that we have. You can still apply, so um, you'll still be able to file the application. You'll just see this little message at the top, um, which says this partner does not have any access grants available at this time, but we'll review it when we have some more. So you can kind of uh, wait in line, I guess, and when we have more access, you'll be able to, to receive that. Some of these available collections, like Bio One, you'll get a question up here that says, how many months do you want to have access for? Um, so many of these accesses only last for a certain amount of time when you apply for them. 
Um, for buyer one, you can actually choose how long you want to have access for. So by default, we say one month, because maybe you only want to access one specific paper that you've already seen. That's fine. You can have access for a month, check that paper out, and then we can give that access to someone else. But if you know you're going to use it over a longer period of time, you can switch that to 12 months um, and have access for, for the whole year. That's no problem at all. It just means that we can kind of give access to as many people as possible um, over the course of the year. So there's a lot of collections here, um, and we appreciate that it's maybe a bit overwhelming the first time you come here and, and don't know what's available. So we've got a few features in the library that help you sort of sort through these. The first you might have noticed already is this favorites tab. At the moment, I don't have any in there. Uh, but if I click one of these stars on these collections, you'll see that the little icon fills in. And now these are available in my favorites tab. So if there are some collections that you use on, on a regular basis, um, then you can add them to your favorites. And now when you come to the library, this favorites tab will be the first one that opens instead of my collections. And so that means you can very quickly go to those collections that you know you, you find useful and that, that you want to access. We also have some filter options on the, the left-hand side here. So um, the first one is language. So you can um, search through this to find any of the uh, languages that, that at least one collection has in, in the library. So for example, I could filter for Italian, and that will just show me the collections which have content in Italian. Um, when it comes to languages, some of these will be exclusively in that language. For example, this is an Italian newspaper, so it is specifically uh, only Italian. Um, but a publisher like Open Edition actually has content in quite a variety of languages. So that just means that um, a good proportion of their content is available in these languages, but, but not everything. Um, it will only be some of the content there. Um, you can click this Reset Filters button anytime to go back to all of the collections. The second filter that's available is Topic. So under Topic, you can go through subjects like art, or business and economics, or history, law. This will help you find um, if you want to write articles about a particular topic, uh, which collections have content in that topic. Now, I've just filtered for law, and you'll notice that many of these collections say multidisciplinary. Um, that means that these are collections which have a pretty wide variety of content. They don't publish on any one specific subject. And so multidisciplinary, we expect that these publishers like Alman Al have content about law somewhere. It's not going to be specifically about law, but they should have some uh, legal related content in there. Um, other collections, if I can find an example, yeah, Hein Online, that's specifically law-based content. So um, you can make a sort of combination of those. You could find, um, you know, content in French that is about the law um, and really sort of get down to the specific collections that are going to be useful to you as a Wikipedia editor on your project. So let me reset those again. Um, the last thing that I think is useful here is this filter collections. So language and tags, um, those topics are, are useful filters, but sometimes there's something you want to search that isn't really covered by those. Um, the, the example that comes to mind for me is newspapers. Newspapers obviously aren't a language. They're also not a topic in the way that we've defined them. And so if you wanted to find publishers that had newspapers, you could come down to this filter collection, type in newspapers, and you'll see that these collections immediately filter for publishers that have newspapers. So that search looks through the title of these collections and also their descriptions. So I found the word newspapers here, and that's why it's it's shown up. So if there's something you're not quite finding um, with the language or topics, that filter can be helpful. So let me reset it again. Um, one final thing. Oh, no, there's two things, actually, I still need to mention. Um, when you have applied for a collection here, uh, and you want to know the status of it, you'll generally receive email updates about that application. So if we have a question for you, you'll get an email. If we approve that application, you'll get an email. But if you want to double check the status of it, you can always come to the library and click this View My Applications button up here, and that will show you your application, so you can go and check in on them. I haven't actually made any on this account, so that none are showing up here, but this is where they would show up if I, if I had an application. So 
there's you'll notice over 100 different collections available here, but we're always looking to add more. Um, if you have ideas or, or requests for us, you can head over to this Suggest a Collection button up in the top right. And this is where we catalog all of these suggestions we've received. So if you have a new suggestion, you can use this form up at the top. You can give us the name of a particular newspaper or website that you're interested in accessing, um, a description of, of what it is, uh, you know, a newspaper that publishes in the country, and share our web, their website so that we can more easily find it. And then you can submit that suggestion, and they go into this very long list here of all of the suggestions that we've received. Um, it's worth checking first if someone else has already suggested it, um, which you can do by using this um, filter here. So for example, I can see the uh, ProQuest historical newspapers is one example. So if I want to check that, I could type ProQuest here. And that shows the suggestions that users have already filed um, for ProQuest. If you would also like access to, to one of these, then you can click this upvote button. And that just helps us catalog how popular are each of these suggestions. You know, what is the priority for us? Um, when we come to decide which collections are we prioritizing, this is one of the main places we come to. We look at the top here, sorted by number of upvotes, um, and really prioritize in this way. Um, you might find some suggestions here that we have. So for example, Wiley, we do now have. Um, we're aiming to get rid of those suggestions. It just requires a little bit of work from us to um, let folks know who'd upvoted it that it's now available, which we haven't done yet. Um, but we try to keep this relatively tidy um, so that it is really just the, the sort of outstanding collections. Um, but yeah, if there is a if there is a source that you want us to get, to get access to in the library, this is the the place to do it. The last feature I want to demo is this search bar at the top. So having all of these collections is is great. It's very useful. Um, if you know which publisher you want to access, right? If you know that the American National Biography has the source that you're interested in accessing. But let's say you're writing about something specific. Um, let's say uh, you want to write about computers. It might not be obvious to you where here actually has content about that subject. And so the first place that you should go instead is this search bar at the top. So let's say we want to write about MacBooks. You can just type the subject in here and click search. And this will take you to um, these search results. So this search tool searches across most of the collections that we have in the library and will directly present you the sources that you might be interested in. So you don't need to know which exact publisher has access to it, which exact collection is most useful. You can just search for the topic that you're writing about, and hopefully you'll find some sources here. Uh, so when you come here, um, ideally, um, up in these top results should be, should be things that are useful to you. You can just click PDF full text, and that will take you straight through to whatever that source is. Um, that is hopefully useful to you. Um, so again, you don't need to know which collection it came from, which publisher it came from. You can just go straight there. I won't go through all of the features here because there is quite a lot. But um, again, in the search results, you have um, some various filters on the left-hand side here. Um, so you could, for example, look at publication dates. So maybe you're only interested in uh, recent MacBooks um, in, in this example. Um, you can search by format. So maybe you're only interested in newspapers or academic journals. Uh, and there's various other filters that you can that you can play around with here. Um, you can also go to an advanced search, which, um, again, I'm not going to go into in detail, but allows you to do things like filter the discipline of the, the subject area that you're interested in, um, really go quite specific with how you're searching, look for certain titles or journal names. Um, this is quite a powerful tool if you get into it. Um, but you can also just use it in a very basic way um, to search for specific subjects. I mentioned that that search tool searches across most of the library's collections. Um, it doesn't search across all of them, um, but one way to check is to look for this magnifying glass up in the corner. So if a collection has this black magnifying glass, that means that that is indexed in that, that search engine. If you find that it's a gray, magnifying glass like this, it means it's partially indexed. So some of the content is in that search engine, but some of it you'll have to go directly to um, American Psychiatric Association in this example. Um, you'll have to go to their website directly to get access to, to some of the content. 
Um, similarly, there are collections like Brill, which don't have that magnifying glass. That means that, that is not currently indexed in the search engine. Um, sometimes that isn't possible. Sometimes we just haven't quite got to it yet. Um, but it does index most of the content in the library. So I think that's everything that I have to demo. I have a few more slides, but I wanted to sort of take a pause here and see if anyone had questions about the demo in particular before I sort of switch off this tab. Um, I see Sandy already asked about whether the search works with DOIs or URLs. Yeah, DOIs definitely. Um, Nikki is our resident librarian, so she knows better than me, but yeah, um, URLs probably don't work. But you should be able to search for identifiers or titles or journal names, and that should uh, should help you through to, to a relevant source. OK, um, I'll jump back to my slides, and we can always come back here um, if you have some more questions uh, later. Oh, um, how about us contribute to how can community help to add more newspapers? Um, yeah, so the best way for you to do that is to um, head over to this Suggest a Collection page and let us know which newspapers you're interested in. Um, newspapers are, are one of those um, kinds of sources that it's quite hard for us to know which newspapers are, are sort of read around the world. Um, you know, we're a pretty small team. We're not that geographically uh, distributed. And so we often don't know exactly which newspapers uh, folks want access to. So um, definitely head over to this page and, and let us know. And thank you, Nikki. Um, how do I access the Q&A feature? Oh, here it is. Is there a way to share findings in between accounts from within the system? So when you say in between accounts, do you mean um, between different Wikipedia users, sort of share results with other editors? Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, OK, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by their question. Um, I think the short answer is, is probably no. But once you have a URL for a for a source, you can obviously share that on, on Wikipedia, but not the, the actual PDF, um, not the actual result. But I'm going to, I have some, some sort of tips and tricks on how to do that in a minute. OK, let me jump back over to my slides. Um, is the newspaper page as thoroughly documented as in metadata? Um, it depends on the source. Um, so the question is whether the newspaper pages are thoroughly documented um, as in their metadata. It depends on the publisher that it's coming from. Sometimes they are quite well well documented. They have good metadata, and sometimes, um, in my experience, they don't. Um, it really depends on the on the collection. Um, a publisher like newspapers.com or British Newspaper Archive tend to have very good metadata on their newspapers. Um, others, it might just be sort of presented as a PDF for you to look through yourself. OK, um, so I wanted to share some information about how the collections are added to the library. So I've mentioned that you can suggest um, suggest additions to the library. And so um, I just want to give a little bit of context on how that works, because we actually don't operate like a normal library. Um, most libraries would pay subscriptions to access uh, all of these publishers' content. In some cases, they pay quite a lot of money, um, but we actually don't pay any money. Um, and that's because we operate on this partnership model uh, where we work with the publishers and come to an agreement that sort of benefits us both without us having to pay them any money. Um, publishers obviously get the benefit of some good publicity. You can see a blog post here from Wiley. Um, it's always a good thing to say that you're working with a Wikipedia, I think. Um, but they also get sort of a tangible benefit of if they're in the library, more Wikipedia editors are using their content, there's more citations, and so that's more readership of their, their sources um, from Wikipedia's readers. Um, I wanted to highlight that it can be a, a fair bit of work from our end to add a new new publisher to the library. And I don't mean to like dissuade you from suggesting new collections, but if you do suggest something, even if we think it's a, a great idea and we reach out to the organization straight away, um, it still can take some time for us to come to an agreement figure out the minutia of it, uh, the details, set everything up, get it on the library. Um, that is often not a quick process. So um, 
I would just request some patience if you uh, if you do suggest something be added to the library. Hopefully we can get to it eventually, but um, it, it can take some time. And if you are going to suggest content for the library, um, ideally that should be content which publishes um, reliable content, um, by which I mean your community should consider it a reliable source. And it should be at least partially paywalled. Um, we have had discussions um, about open access content in the library. Um, obviously, we would love to um, promote more open access content. It's been a bit, um, it's been hard for us to figure out how to situate that in the library without sort of confusing folks because we could have a theoretically limitless amount of open access content listed in the library. So that's something we're still looking into. Um, but for now, really, we're, we're seeing the library as specifically a place for free access to paywall content. It shouldn't be the only place you do research. You can still use the, the open web um, to look for open access content. And I will say that that search bar um, at the top of, of the library, um, that does also search through open access content. So although it, it does primarily uh, search the content in the library, there's also plenty of open access content available through that search bar too. Um, but in terms of suggestions for now, we're partnering really with, with publishers that, that have paywalled content. Um, some of our partners are like mostly open access or have open access collections, but they have at least some, some paywalled content. So um, I have two sort of final tips and tricks to share. Um, the first is about accessing a specific source. So I've shown you how to sort of go into the library and browse and search um, in general. But what happens if you have one specific source that you want to be able to access? So for example, let's say you're on Wikipedia and you see this citation. Um, it's to a, a paper and you want to be able to, to get access to it and to read it. If you click that link, um, you will end up here. And you, if you try to access the PDF, it's going to ask you to pay um, before you can access the journal. Um, in this case, it's a little perhaps unclear where, where the sources come from because it says American Association for Anatomy. But if you look in the URL in this case, it's from Wiley.com. And Wiley is a publisher that we have access to through the library. So how do you go from this page to getting access through the library? There's a few different ways. The, the first and maybe most obvious way is you can sort of start at the beginning, navigate to the library, scroll down until you find Wiley, click Access Collection, and then search for the title or the DOI or, or something else um, in the search bar uh, and go through to the, the paper there. The next option you have is obviously to use that search bar that's, that I showed you up at the top of the, the library. You can just put the title or again, the, the DOI or, or other identifier um, in that search bar. And then hopefully that should uh, crop up at the top of the, the search results if we have access to it through the library. Um, but the third way is slightly more direct. Um, it's a bit more hit and miss, but this is a, a little trick that you can use. This URL, um, you can put the URL that you have at the end of it. And if, uh, so in this example, we just put that URL uh, at the end. And if we have access to that content through the library and it's available in our proxy system, then you'll go straight through to the thing you are trying to access. So obviously I don't expect you to remember that URL. You'd want to bookmark it or, or save it somewhere. I can share the URL string uh, in chat in a minute. Um, but you can just put the, the content you're trying to access at the end and it'll go straight through if, if we have access to it. You might see a, an error message if, if you don't. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is about citing proxied sources. So what do I mean by a proxied source? When you use the library, um, if you're using one of those uh, collections that you have access to straight away, where you just click access collection and, and end up on their website, you're doing you're going through um, a proxy server that we have set up to, to do that. So same example paper that we were looking at earlier, uh, when you go through to that paper and you see that we have full access, and you see the Wikipedia library at the top. The URL that you're actually in looks a bit looks a bit funny. Um, so there's this sort of Wikipedia library.idm.oclc.org in, in the URL. That's because when you've gone through the library, we have sent you sort of through our proxy server, and it's, re, it's changed the URL. And that's helpful because it means you can go straight through without needing 
an account on this website or a voucher code or, or anything else, it means you can go straight through. But it does mean that citing it is, is slightly awkward. So if you tried to use that URL on Wikipedia, for example, in the citation generating tool, you'd find that the citation it generates isn't, um, isn't accurate. So in this case, when I, when I tried it earlier today, uh, it just sends you through to like the Wikipedia library. Like that citation is not, is not the correct one, right? We're interested in the paper that we were trying to cite. Um, and that URL actually won't, won't lead anywhere for, for any user. So how do we cite that? Um, unfortunately, there's no sort of easy solution. We have been talking about some ways to make this easier. But for now, the, the best sort of solution really is you take the URL that you have, uh, you remove that wikipedia library.idm.oclc.org section of it, delete that, and then in the section before it, you convert the dashes to dots. And that should sort of reconstruct the URL that, uh, that you need. And again, when you try that on Wikipedia, that URL will then will then be correct and will generate the correct metadata. Um, and we'll also have a URL that anyone can get through to. Obviously, they are then going to hit the paywall themselves, but that's a sort of unfortunate um, side effect of how the library works. So those are the couple of tips and tricks I have. Um, Mickey has helpfully put in chat that we have yeah, a newsletter which includes other access tips and tricks. Um, you can go and check that out. The final thing I wanted to say is the Wikipedia library is translated into a variety of languages. Um, so when you use the library, it should pick up your um, either your Wikipedia language or your browser language and, and show the library in your language if possible. But um, all those translations are community driven. So you can head over to this Translate Wiki um, project, uh, head over to the Find the Library Cloud platform on there. And then there you could translate it into your language so that your community can, can make use of the library. Um, I think we find that it's obviously nicer if, uh, if you turn up at the library and it's in, in your language um, rather than some other fallback language or English. Um, I think we have something like a dozen languages supported right now. Um, with sort of full translations, but um, you can head over there and see see how it's doing. So that's it. That's all I have to share. Um, again, that is the URL for the library. You can head over and check it out if, if you're eligible to use it. If not, keep editing and you'll get that notification uh, soon, I hope. And uh, thank you for taking the time. Happy to, to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Sam, for that lovely, comprehensive introductory presentation. Uh, we have we have some time for questions, and I believe the chat has already been buzzing while you were speaking. Nikki, welcome. Always good to have librarians with us. Uh, so there are a few questions in the chat. I'll take the ones that are already there, those who are just processing the presentation. Uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat, or there's a Q&A feature also, however you like it. Uh, I will, uh, there are a few questions that you've already answered, so I'll take the one after get. Um, uh, so Frederick has a question uh, where he says, okay, is it possible to boost the visibility of more open access work, especially as this is closer to the Wikipedia ideology of openness and sharing? In spite of open access being easily available, it does need to be showcased and made easily accessible, maybe through a single book. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, like I mentioned, um, that's something we've been talking about, whether we could sort of document some kind of open access sources in the library. It's it's kind of hard because we're trying to figure out, you know, should the library, should we just scope the library to specifically, this is where you get paywall sources, but open access sources are obviously available elsewhere. Or should we be trying to do sort of everything in the library? It'd be, you know, a one-stop shop for all of your Wikipedia research. Um, I think that's still a debate that we're having. I appreciate you bringing it up because I think that makes, that, that makes me think that maybe we should think about it some more. Um, I could imagine us showcasing open access content in the library as well. If we did, um, when we've talked about this before, I think it would probably be a, a sort of community-led effort. Um, you know, at the foundation, we're a pretty small team working on the library. We probably don't have the capacity to sort of document 
every open access collection there is uh, there. So if we did, we'd probably make it uh, look to make it sort of a community-led process where in some way the community can document these these sources. But I'd say the main thing that's held us back is just trying to figure out, do we want to extend the library to be the one place you go to do your research or just a place you do, you do your research? And, and I think we didn't really quite come to a conclusion on that yet. Thank you so much on that, Sam. Frederick has got two more questions and quite interesting ones like that. Uh, while others process their thought, I will use my powers as the host to put forth a question of my own, jump the queue a bit. What do you think of uh, how, when you, in your last slide, I remember you mentioning about adding sources to the library that are credible. Uh, how exactly do you guys go about determining? I'm sure you would get applications for adding sources which you uh, just kind of you feel you can't add them because they don't make the cut for what qualifies as a credible life. So what are the criteria that you look for? Yeah, I'd say so. Primarily, actually, what we're looking for is um, do Wikipedia communities or Wikimedia communities consider this credible? Um, we sort of try not to be too much arbiters of, of whether something is reliable or not. Um, if there is a Wikimedia community that says, we want access to this, we think it's useful and reliable, you know, in our context, then, okay, that's fine. You know, we'll, we'll sort of follow that. Um, I think there have definitely been at least one or two sources we've added to the library where, so one Wikimedia community says, I don't think this is reliable. And one says, well, we would find it useful and we want to use it in our community. And so we say, well, okay, you know, if, if you're going to find that useful, then then we trust you. Um, obviously, the, the suggestions are only one way we're deciding what to add to the library. We're also sort of, um, doing our own lead uh, partnerships where we know that there are big publishers or, or obviously reliable content that, that we can add. So it's always a mix between those two things. But I think, yeah, primarily we're sort of looking to the community and looking to the policies that are set up on those on those wikis for, for what they consider to be reliable and, and letting them take the lead, really. So Frederick has another question where he says, hey, what about diversity of sources? Most of the knowledge of our planet is, to use an unhappy word, trapped in regional languages, and we are rather monolingual or big language focused in our approaches. Yeah, this is a great question. And I think something that we've been wrestling with for, for years really is that um, when we think about building a library, you know, on, on, on the team, we are <clears throat> predominantly from sort of North America and Europe, not, not exclusively, I should say. Um, but, you know, we have sort of that context of, of what is a reliable source, what is a, a reliable publisher. And we've been really trying over the years to diversify the content in the library, move away from only English language sources or only the big obvious publishers um, and really try and try and get a, a better diversity of language and topic and um, region. And that has we've had some some sort of struggles with that honestly um part of the reason for that is that we on the team um only have so many languages that we can we can speak right and so when we go out to organizations to try to add them to the library sometimes there's just a language barrier we just we you know we we struggle to get to get past that um the other problem we have is identifying what is a reliable source in a particular language or, or a particular region um and so that's why um getting those suggestions is why I keep talking about them. And that's why that's so important because we want to hear, okay, this is a reliable newspaper in my in my country. And we can say, okay, great. That's someone we can go and target now. It may not have been obvious to us before that, that that was the, the sort of most trusted newspaper there. Um, the other problem that we've run up against is that um, the Wikipedia library is a is a digital library, right? We don't have any in-person in -person content. And so if we're partnering with an organization to get their content in the library, they need to be able to somehow give access to Wikipedia editors. Um, and sometimes we've tried to partner with an organization and they just don't have any way to do that. They don't have a sort of voucher code system or they can't accept a proxy based access or maybe their content just isn't even digitized. Um, so sometimes that's been an issue for us in, in sort of diversifying the content. Um, but it is a sort of top level goal for us to, to really diversify what what languages and regions the, the library covers. And so, as I say, please suggest um, 
to those organizations, those collections we should be heading. Uh, to add a follow-up question to that, do you, by any chance, somewhere in the pipeline, uh, as something you'd like to do in the future, do you have, would you like to maybe go visit libraries and digitize them and add them to the Wikipedia collection? Is that something for regional small players who do not really have that kind of, uh, those sort of resources? Is that something you are open to consider? It's not really something that we have the capacity to do, honestly. You know, that's quite a big undertaking. Um, it's the kind of thing that organizations like the Internet Archive are, are you know, much better positioned to, to help with, with all the infrastructure and processes that, that they have. So that kind of digitization, I don't think, is something that, that we would do. Um, but certainly we have um, tried to work with local affiliates um, on occasion, and, and that kind of thing has been explored. It, it, it is just a hard thing to do at, at scale, really. You know, it's easy to digitize one book or two books. It's pretty hard to digitize hundreds or thousands uh, in a meaningful way without spending a lot of a lot of time and money on it. Another question by Frederick, and then Ter, I believe Farija has raised her hand, so I think she can unmute herself uh, right after this question. So Frederick says there also seems to be a hierarchy of knowledge which we do seem to be subconsciously supporting. Bigger is better. If it comes from a big publisher or some global center, then it is useful, credible knowledge. But the reality is that a lot of the diversity of the world's production of the knowledge is simply devalued through such approaches consciously or unconsciously. How do we go about navigating that tightrope walk? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't have much to say about that because I think it's a it's a great point and, and I don't think we have an easy answer um, except to say that, you know, we're, we're trying to diversify and we do want to um, we do want to move away from only focusing on those biggest, um, biggest, <laughs> most expensive uh, English language publishers and, and really try to get more. But um, yeah, I think it's a I think it's a great point. Khadija, I believe uh, you had a question. You raised your hand. You can can unmute yourself and. Mine actually. Uh, good evening. Hello. Uh, yes. Good mine, evening. Uh, mine is not actually a question, but uh, I would like to say I got a free membership of Wikipedia Library last month. This was, uh, I'm very happy to say that this was after made a lot of contribution in the Wikicommon and Wikimedia, but I've not started yet uh, doing any edit, but I can say there are a lot of collections eh, from the Wikipedia library. That's great. I hope you find it useful. Yeah. Definitely, the enthusiasm of running into the Wikipedia library is definitely relatable when you land there for the first time and you're like, oh, wow, I, I can just use all of this. So definitely, yeah. I'm sure yeah. that enthusiasm is something which we all relate with, something that happened to all of us at some point in time. Uh, then uh, Ramu MS has a question where he says, okay, how to handle the copyright issues when we are lending the digital content? Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ram, you're asking about uh, citation and how to cite uh, content derived from the library correctly. Is that what you mean, or is it something else? Yes, yes. Actually, when we are doing the uh, digital lending, uh, there will be some pre people may take the printouts, or maybe they may take the screenshots. Uh, there is no, uh, we cannot disable the screenshot uh, option or maybe the print option or converting into the PDF or downloading the content. So during that, when we do this uh, digital content, is there any way to uh, stop all this, Karke? Yeah, so I'd say from our perspective, we're mostly sort of trusting the Wikipedia's communities to be looking for copyrighted content, you know, uh, and removing that. But as far as we're concerned, as, as long as you um, summarize content in your own words on Wikipedia, 
add that citation back to where you got it. There shouldn't be any issues with copyright. Um, just don't obviously copy large um, sections of text and paste them into Wikipedia. Don't, um, as you say, take screenshots and, and upload them. Um, but my hope is that then the, the Wikipedia community is a, a sort of looking for that sort of thing and, and, and dealing with it. That's That's been our experience over I guess the, the last 10 years of, of the library running, we've, we've not really had any copyright issues uh, crop up because I think Wikimedia communities are, are, are pretty on top of that in, in my experience. Great. Uh, if uh, Mohammed Yassin has a question, if the general public can't access these journals rather than the, pri rather than the privileged editors. Uh, okay, so the, Privileged editors can access these journals, but the general public can't. How much effective the use of these? How much? How effective are these journals when it comes to citations? Uh, big ethical question, Sam. Over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's definitely one of the big ethical questions. And what I'll say is, um, obviously, an open access source is is preferable if it's equal quality to a closed access source, then clearly citing something that the Wikipedia readers and the general public can access is is a, a better a better option. I wouldn't say that you have to cite the library if you found something you know somewhere else. Um, but I think there is still a benefit to the general public of, of citing these sources because if the general public can't access this source to see what it says, that information is completely lost to them, right? But if you're able to summarize it and put it on Wikipedia, that means that they now have access to some of the content from that source. They can learn what it said, they can learn what the insight was. Um, and so you've brought some of that knowledge to them. Um, clearly, you know, I wish we were in a world where all of this content was open access and, and we didn't need to run the library. Um, but for now, I think that's that's sort of the, the, uh, the silver lining for me is that at least you're able to bring that much content to, to the general public and they can see what what information that they otherwise might not have been able to find. Nandor, I believe I'm not butchering your name. Uh, I hope that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, asks, is it is the Wikipedia library related in any way to the books on Wikisource? The short answer is no. Um, we haven't really integrated at all in Wikisource. Um, and obviously, with a lot of the library's content being sort of closed access and copyrighted, there hasn't really been much, um, I think, importing of the library to Wikisource or anything like that. So no, it's been it's been not that, as far as I'm aware, not very integrated with Wikisource so far. Sandy Zuckman has a question regarding bot access. Uh, I get the feeling this might be. I get the get the feeling this might be considered a difficult question. Could I email Sam or Nikki or someone uh, later to talk about setting up a limited experiment, example a couple dozen accesses from a bot as a proof of concept, and then go from there depending on the foundation's perceived value. <laughs> Yeah, ab absolutely. Please do. Um, I'm just going to put our email address in in the chat. So if you email that, that will come to the team, um, and we can we can have a look at what you're proposing and let you know, um, yeah, how feasible it is from our side. There are no further questions that I see in the chat. Also, feel free if you guys, uh, like Khadija said, if you have comments, observations. Uh, experience of using the Wikipedia library, please feel free to mention them. We have like a few more minutes, five minutes or so. Uh, Nikki, also, if you have something to say, to contribute, to add to what Sam has already said, you're more than welcome. Yeah, I also just want to briefly say that Vipin is is also here. He's um, He handles all the partnerships for the library. So big thanks to him for his work on that. Welcome, Vipin. Thank you, thank you both. Uh, Ramu MS has raised uh, his hand again. Uh, Ramu, I believe you can unmute Thanks, Monib. Thanks, Monib. Uh, this is a very specific question. Uh, I own close to about 10,000 books on one particular book uh, subject called Philately. Okay, uh, the books range from 1894 to up to the year 2000 close to five, about 10,000 books and magazines. 
on British Indian philately, which I plan to digitize and give the content for the posterity. But I'm little apprehensive whether I land in any copyright or any other trouble. So that's my question to Sam or Nikki or <laughs> whoever the expert is. Yeah, unfortunately, I am not a lawyer, so I don't know how much help I will be. Um, I guess it depends what you're, where you're planning to upload these materials. I mean, I don't think that digitizing them, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think digitizing them is necessarily an issue in itself. Um, but if you're going to upload to, uh, for example, Wikimedia Commons, you probably need to go and look at the copyright guidance on, on Commons or on the Wikimedia project that you're interested in. Um, that's going to be a better information for you than, than I'll have, I think, unfortunately. Sorry, I can't be more helpful. I, uh, okay, Mohammed Yasin has a question where he says, okay, how can the local, local user groups and communities help the Wikipedia library to increase their content and encourage local newspapers that they already given as paid into the Wikipedia library? Okay. Um, I, I believe okay, the question means yeah, how can local user groups and communities kind of come together and maybe advocate with libraries and resources to, if there is a way, maybe, I guess a good way to rephrase this would be, hey, how can we help you to do your job better? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, so yeah, local user groups and affiliates are really a huge, a huge um, help to us, um, mostly because of that language and, and sort of knowledge barrier. So we work with Wikimedia Deutschland quite closely on German uh, language sources. So they're in much closer touch with the German language Wikipedia. They can talk to them, figure out what the priorities are for them. And then we sort of help them with conversations with organizations. And they can be having those conversations in German, you know, in their native language, uh, without having to sort of work with us in English. Um, and that can really help to get those, those organizations in the library. So um, if you want to help us out, then that is absolutely something that we can we can work on together. I would say send us an email. Um, I put our uh, I'll put our team's email in the chat again. Send us an email if you're interested in helping out, because we can kind of figure out together. Um, you know, how can we speak to the the communities that you work with and find out what they want, and then maybe we can work with you on some local partnerships. Uh, we've done this in in a few cases, and it's been you know, very helpful. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sam. I believe we are just out of time. Uh, so if anyone has further questions, observations, I'm sure I had a bunch of my questions which I couldn't get addressed, but that's it. That is what it is being the host. So we, you can take it over. Uh, have the, uh, Ask those questions on email or get in touch with Sam or Nikki or even Vipin on the Wikipedia side of the internet. Um, thank you so much for uh, Sam for the presentation and answering the questions. And thank you to Vipin, Nikki for coming and also making the conversation a useful one. All everyone who asked questions participated in any way. Thank you, Jessica, for allowing us to access, allowing us access to like a premium account so that we could record this meeting. Um, Thank you, Afi, of course, uh, the founder of DCW, who has organized all of this, got in touch with everyone. And yeah, I, I hope we see you guys in the next conversation hour with more conversations. And let's see where we can take the ball from here. Thank you so much. <laughs>